Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I am him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full." See, in the Old Testament, the Jews would have thought of themselves as the vine. And there's tons of scriptures throughout the Old Testament that would have symbolized that. Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. Israel, Israel is an empty vine. That's Hosea 10, 1. So the Jews would have had this clear picture thinking of themselves as this vine. So Jesus comes on to the scene. He says something completely revolutionary to them, and he presents this new way of thinking for them. He says, I am the true, genuine vine. He is telling them now that the nation of Israel is not the genuine vine. He's saying their identification with the Jewish nation and the Jewish religion is not what is the most important thing. Get this. This is very important. Jesus is saying the most important thing now is for his disciples to be related to him. He is saying your identification with a religion, a ceremony, an organization, it's not what's important anymore. But what's important is abiding and being with him. You see, here, God is the owner of the vineyard. He is the keeper. He is the farmer. Jesus is presenting this allegory. On Wednesday night, I used this word uh, hyperbole, which is uh, a way of speaking. When you approach the Bible, you can't just approach the Bible ignorantly and blindly. You have to approach it considering how it was written, who wrote it, why they wrote it. That's called exegesis. You're, ex you're exegeting the scripture. You're going and looking for the original context. And what does it mean to the individuals who wrote it and to the people they were writing it to? And on Wednesday night, I used this word hyperbole, which is this exaggerated language that Jesus spoke with. And then I demonstrated to you how we speak in exaggerated language when I say, I almost died laughing. That's an exaggerated speech. I wasn't going to die laughing, but I was exaggerating. I was speaking in this hyperbolic language. Politicians speak fearfully hyperbolically, uh, which is why when you listen to the news channels, you have great anxiety and fear because they're constantly presenting to you this exaggerated speech. And I just share with you that to say, today Jesus is speaking with an allegory, which is a story or a poem that has a deeper or hidden meaning. And so when you look at this, you have to consider, and this one's fairly easy to understand, but there are things in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that you have to approach and understand the, the writing style in order for you to best understand the text under consideration. So what Jesus is saying here is God is the owner of the vineyard. He is the keeper. He is the farmer. Jesus is saying that he is this genuine and true vine and the father takes care of him. And the branches that are being represented are the disciples and followers of Christ. You see in verse two, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may be more 
fruitful. This term in me is the idea of what salvation is. So when we say, when Jesus says every branch that is in me, you're basically, you're a part of, you're a part of the kingdom of God, right? He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his followers. In turn, would be speaking to you, right? He is saying, if you are saved, you will bear fruit. You will bear more fruit and you will bear much and great fruit. What is this fruit being referenced? Many scholars would just say it's as simple as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. You see, Jesus is saying this fruit bearing is what the life of a believer looks like. So if you are this branch that is in Him, you will bear the fruit of the character of the kingdom of God here on earth. John 15, 8 says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So God is glorified. The objective of Christianity is not to come to a church and warm a pew. Believe that or not. Uh, the Bible says that. The Bible doesn't say anything about church attendance as a evidence of a saving faith. And the objective of a Christian is to glorify God with our lives. And so in that we are to be magnifiers of God to a lost, hurting, and broken world. So when we bear this fruit, we are, uh, we are glorifying God, which is shining a light on or pointing towards God. So when people see us, they should see our life proving to the world that we are followers of Jesus. Your life should say to a hurting, lost, and broken world, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. And it should signal to people, it is good. And so I ask you, is that what Christianity and the church presents to the world? Don't miss this. If you are in Him, you produce this fruit that brings yourself and those around you into the presence of God by your very life. So when you're around other people, you should be helping usher them into the kingdom and presence of God through God glorifying himself through you, right? And you know you're not doing this on your own. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit upon our proclamation of faith until we stand in the presence of God in glory. So you're not doing this on your own. You can't even abide in God on your own. You can only abide in God because God allows you to abide in Him. So does your life, in the presence of your life, around your friends, your loved ones, your co-workers, does it point them towards God? He takes away. So this idea of taking away, every branch in me is, is signifying this idea of we're in Christ, that's salvation, that's us making this declaration, this proclamation of faith, that we're surrendering, yielding our will, our way to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That does not bear fruit, He takes away. What does it mean to take away? It means you are taken away from the ability to bear fruit. These branches, they're unfruitful ones. What fruit they may have seemed to have withers and proves to not be genuine. How many people have you seen come and go in the faith walk? How many people have you seen that have these encounters with God, but they don't actually kind of make it through the trial, right? They don't stick around. And so we would say that that's not genuine fruit. So we have this idea of pruning. Pruning is when you selectively remove branches from a tree. I myself am not a good pruner of a tree. I can kill them. If you don't prune a tree properly, it, it, it will die, right? The goal is to remove unwanted branches, improve the tree structure, and direct new and healthy growth. So pruning can be this idea of correction. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he, every branch that does bear fruit, I'm sorry. So you're a believer. You're abiding in Christ. You think you've arrived, right? I'm on easy street. I got my best life now, right? I'm super blessed all the time, right? 
That's not how, that's not anything that I read in this book right here. Uh, in fact, I keep coming across all these, uh, these, these storms and troubles and temptations and different things that Jesus himself said, it's coming, man. You better be ready. You better be rooted. You better find your strength. So this, this idea of pruning is this idea of Jesus is telling you, you're abiding in me. You're one of mine. I'm going to prune you. I'm going to take you deeper. I'm going to take you to deeper waters to seek more spiritual fruit so that out of that becomes this incredible abundant life. I like to describe it this way. This is how I describe this. The lower, the higher I go in, in the kingdom of God, the lower I go in the world's eyes. So like the more that I high, the more I climb in pursuit of the kingdom of God, the world thinks that I've lost my mind. And so as you're pursuing and assenting towards the kingdom of God and Christ-like living in ways, the world's going to think that doesn't make any sense. Why would you present yourself in a way that you would love this person who sought to do harm to you? You know, as one example, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Hebrews 12, 6 says that God corrects everyone that he loves. Pruning represents growth, and growth in God should make us more dependent upon Him. So here is the measuring rod for your spiritual growth. If you are trying to grow in Christ's likeness, it should mean you're more dependent upon Him. So you have the Holy Spirit who illuminates the biblical text for you. But as you're drawing closer to Christ, you're becoming more dependent upon Him. Every word, every thought, every action, I'm... What does the word say? I call it, I got my God dar going, where I'm like, everything that's happened to me, I'm gauging that. What does the word say? What does the word say? I'm saying that privately and quietly in my head and in my heart. And sometimes I know what the word says, and I reject it. That's called sin. And I struggle with that, too. But you should become more dependent upon God, not less, which means that you should be more dependent upon the body of believers not less. Pruning can be painful just as a physical branch can be cut and bleed, so too our emotions can be affected. So as Jesus is telling us, I'm going to prune you. Why? Because when I prune you, greater growth will come. And so in that, Jesus is saying the pruning process may be a little painful, may be a little sacrificial, may be something that is hard for you to do. We have to draw near and be very close to God. We have to cling and hang to every word. I want to know what God says about this. I want to know what God says about that. I want to know how I can make application to my life so that I can do what the Lord would want me to do in this situation, not what my flesh and my feelings say that I want to do in this situation. I have this illustration for you that I'm going to show that maybe will make it easier for I have these three envelopes. This biggest one says God on it. The next biggest one says Jesus on it. The smallest one says Tom on it. And then I have this piece of paper that we'll call the Holy Spirit. And so I've got this slip of paper. The Bible says that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. So that is this small envelope that says Tom Gensler. This slip of paper represents the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when Tom Gensler surrenders to Christ, Christ comes inside of me. So I slip this piece of paper inside of this envelope, and this represents my relationship with Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit comes to reside inside Tom. But not only is Christ in Tom, but Tom is now in Christ. So the slip of paper that is in Christ is in Tom, but Tom accepted Christ, so Tom came inside of Christ. So now I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, and so now I actually am in Christ as well. So now the Bible says that Christ is in God, so we are going to slip the Christ envelope in the God envelope. Here's my point. In order to, in order to know... In, in, what's that? Yeah, it does rock, doesn't it? So in order to now get to Tom, because this is what happens with you guys. You crumble under the little bit of temptation or pressure. You act like you have no authority. You act like you're walking under your own abilities. And so you have this, you have this illustration that I gave you. You've got to go through God to get through Christ, right? 
And you think you've gotten a hold of Tom when you get when when you, when you got to go through God to get a hold of Christ. Uh, then you think you got a hold of Tom when you open up the Christ envelope. Here's the issue, though. So you got me right here, right? So you got through you got through God. You think you got through Christ. You get a hold of me, and you're like, I got him. He's gonna I'm gonna destroy him. Well, the problem is when you open me up. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. So I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. Christ is in God. God is in Christ. So I am well covered. You are well covered as you abide in Christ. Upon your proclamation of faith, the Bible says, immediately. Not some special second baptism, weird thing that is not biblical, does not happen. The moment you proclaim Jesus Christ, Paul tells us, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Then you are in Jesus Christ. So you are basically covered all the way around. But yet, you don't walk in that assurance. And you know why you don't walk in that assurance? Because you're ignorant of this. You don't know what it says. Or you have these broad generalities from those mustard seed Bible studies that aren't bad. But I found you've got to drink in the Word into overflowing amounts. If you, if you ever leave a pitcher that you're filling up with lemonade or tea under the sink and you walk away for a second and overflows, like that's the overflowingness that you must have with this very word of God. Jesus tells us in verse 3, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. He tells us uh, in, in Matthew 5, I believe, Blessed are the pure in heart. There's only one way you can become pure in heart. That is through the reading of the Word of God. Already are you clean because of the Word that I have spoken to you. This is, everything in here is God spoken, God breathed through human authors. It's called the plenary verbal inspiration theory. 1,500 years, around 40 authors, the Holy Spirit worked with these guys to construct what we would call our Holy Bible. That's a kind of a general sense of that. So you're made clean because of the Word that Jesus is speaking. This pruning represents a cleansing process. Peter tells us that we are born and washed clean by the Word of God. The journey of life can cause us to get dirty. Just speaking of my own life, I have temptations, struggles, all of the manifestations of the flesh that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. I wrestle with each of them every single day day, but I order my steps. Because people will come to me, because I was that old car guy who made a living lying to people. And the only thing I ever did good at was when I went to seminary, I got straight A's. I did so good, they said, will you, will you get into a doctorate program? And I said, holy cow, Tom Gensler will never have DR or PhD. But that's not who I am. But they wanted me to do that. And I share that with you to say that I wanted to be a serious student of the Word of God. But I wasn't always a serious student. In fact, never in life was I a serious student. But you'll only, you'll only be made clean by washing your head and heart with the Word of God. One of my mentors says it's the longest 18 inches of your life. You can get it here, and you can know a lot of Word, but if the Word doesn't get to here, this is what God's examining. God's examining your heart. Not this head knowledge that all of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes would have been spewing and saying in their day. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? The answer is, By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. It's that whole, Love the Lord your God with all of your strength with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. It's your entire being. Not just this set-aside time on Sunday where I go to church. It's the moment I go to bed, from the moment I wake up, I'm thinking about God. Wayne Grudem is a theologian that I love to read, and Wayne says this, We're so sinful when we sleep, we sin. That proves to you how fallen and broken you are. And if you have dreams like I do, when you wake up, you go, I kill people you know, in my dream, you know, and you're like, I'm sinful, like I'm a broken person, you can't escape it, right, and so you have to be saying, when I wake up, the devil should be saying, oh boy, Tom Gensler woke up, what's he going to do today, 
I got to try to trip him up. I'm going to hit him up on the text or through the social media before he even gets out of bed to get him all mad and throw him way off course. That ever happened to you? Every day? Yeah, me too, right? I'm the same way, and so I have to guard my heart, we're told, because it's a wellspring of life, right? A lot of things flow out of that. By guarding it according to your word, my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that's that whole, that's my God, Dar. Like all the word that I know, I'm deploying it every single day, everything I know about the word, to like keep myself from sinning, to keep myself from being an upright and righteous, godly person. Uh, a man who's leading my wife, a man who's leading my children, a man who's trying to lead people and souls and trust to his care. We are to be, as Paul said, imitators of God. And so you should see my life and see what you think a representation of Jesus looks like here on earth. But then I would push back on you and say, brothers and sisters, so are you. So the measuring rod you hold to me, I'm going to gently, lovingly, and kindly hold to you. Can you truly be made clean without the Word of God? I submit to you, it's an impossibility. So if you're not in this on a consistent daily basis, I submit to you moment by moment, thought by thought. Like, I'm not just, I don't have an hour where I read it. I'm like thinking about it. I'm chewing on it, meditate on it, going to it, referencing it. People will call me and ask for advice and almost... Nine out of ten times, I just reference you back to Scripture. This is what the Scriptures say. And oftentimes I found it's not what I really like. Because like when, when somebody I love is hurting, I want to go make the other people hurt too. Right? But that's not what the Lord told us to do. Termites. They're bugs that feed on cellulose, which is a compound found in wood in most homes. They literally can destroy your home from the inside out. I believe Christians who don't feed from the Word of God and align and abide their lives with God through His Word, I believe they're like termites. They are constantly bringing the world and the world's fleshly and deathly ways into the church, which ultimately undermine Christ and the walk of the believer. So I'm here to tell you, I'm not calling you a termite, but you have your own conviction. If you're not in the Word, the Word is the only way you can be made clean. The Word is the only way you're going to draw closer to Christ. Because what God does is as you're reading the Word, His Holy Spirit that resides in you as the believer makes this come to life and make sense. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says it's useful for teaching, correction, and training a man in righteousness. Hebrews 4, 12 says it's active and alive. So when you read these words, these are the very mind and voice of God. You want to know what God thinks? You read these words. That's why I love the red letters because like Jesus is dropping knowledge on people and he drops knowledge on people in ways that seem so simple yet they're so profound that only God in the flesh could do what he's doing. Verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This idea of abiding is used 10 times in 11 verses. He uses the word fruit six times to abide in Christ means you have this constant communion with Him all the time, day and night. There's a ton of worship songs that sing that way. Remain in me. So I have this question. To be in constant contact with someone means what? You have this intimate, personal relationship with them. You know their voice. You know what it sounds like. I know my wife intimately. Her side of the bed smells pleasant and sweet and like all the conditioner and soap that she puts in her hair and the perfume. My bed side doesn't smell like that. But I can just roll over onto her side and I can go, that smells like my wife. 
Lisa, right? But I have this intimate, like, you, you don't know what my wife smells like. I don't know what your wife smells like, right? But she probably has this sweet, literally sweet fragrance that comes off of her of, of this perfume or thing that she likes that you would love for her to have so that she feels beautiful, so that you know she knows that you're thinking of her in pleasant ways. But I have this intimacy that only I have with that person. And that's this idea of abiding with. Like you're close to. Don't miss this. The abide means you have this close fellowship with. We just saw in verse 3 where to abide means you are washed daily through the word with Christ. In verse 10, we just talked about this in the prayer time. If you keep my commandments, Jesus said, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. That was that whole envelope illustration that I just gave you. So as we do the will of God, this is the will of God. Not what you think it says, but what it actually says. And then after you've applied what I call a historical grammatical hermeneutic, then you understand what the Bible really says, not what you think, which is eyes of Jesus, but what you think it says exegetically. And that's how you conclude on what the word is really talking about. And I just used all of those big words, but really what that just means is that you are serious about knowing what the word says and that you've thought deeply and profoundly about it. Before I come to you to preach a text, I've probably read that text 50 times. You, you know the sense of it, the flow of it. Like you can go, oh, I know I was in 10, now I'm going to go back to 3. It's like when I'm in, I, I, I love to preach in Ephesians because I can go from Ephesians 4.1 to Ephesians 1.10 and Ephesians 1.4 because Paul's referencing those as he's in chapter 4 all the way back to chapter 1. You start to know the sense of how it was written and why it was written and you have this intimacy with the biblical text which is the mind of God. You see, Jesus is saying here in verse 10, Obedience is crucial to proper fellowship with me. And two words we do not like in our culture are obedience and submission. I think for a lot of reasons. I think feminism messed it up a lot. But I also think the roots of, of the United States of America don't reside in obedience and submission. Because how did we, how did we found our country? Rebellion. On rebellion, right? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just here to tell you that like we have these roots in us that like we dislike. You tell me to be obedient? Like I'm a I live in I live in America. This is this is my address. This is my plot of land and by golly I'll defend it to the end of my life, right? That's how we like to think, be and do. So do you listen to and obey God? It's easy to say you do, but if you don't know the word, it's an impossibility to do. It was that illustration I gave you with the idea of the dirty plate. You're going to scrub really hard to clean that plate, or you're going to just soak it in some hot water and come back and check on it later. The soaking does all of the hard work. And it's as I sit in the presence of God, it's not through any works. Paul in Galatians beat it into our heads that like there's no work you're going to do to be saved. That's why I use the word circumcision like 20 times or something crazy because the Jews kept wanting to say, we believe in Jesus, but we also believe in righteous works, the law and circumcision. And Paul's like, no, none of that matters. It's literally by hearing with faith that you are saved. In us, it's having this intimate and personal relationship, abiding in Christ, where God does this transformative work. You can't abide in Christ unless God allows you to abide in Christ, right? So it's nothing you're doing, but it's you going to the Lord with humility and positioning yourself, because after all, Lordship is taking a knee, right? Lordship is saying, you are over me, God, and I am submitting my will, my way, my desires, and that might even be your finances, that might be your career, that might be your possessions, that might be your vacation, that might be your home remodel, that might be your retirement. There could be all kinds of things that are yours that God could say, it's actually mine. And the Lord may bless you with that. And that's a great and wonderful and beautiful and joyous thing. But if those things are taking a higher position in your life than Jesus, then I submit to you, you've broken the first of the Ten Commandments. You've got idols 
in your land. Verses 5 through 7, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me. Again, abiding, this means remains, constant communion, you're close. Whoever abides in me and I in him, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So you are only fruitful from your abiding in, remaining close to Jesus. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and he withers. And that branch and and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If he abides, his views abide. If he abides, his priorities abide. If he abides, his principles abide. If he abides, his promises abide. If he abides, his commandments abide. If, in short, when Christ abides in us, his words abide in us. And so, as we're abiding, remaining close to Jesus, we have his words close to us. So when the words of Jesus abide in us, we hear them. He tells us in Matthew 7, that wise builder story, and we obey. He says, you're a wise man who built your house and foundation on a rock if you hear my words and obey them. He says, you're a fool, and you built your house on sand if you hear my words and disobey them. You can do nothing. That, that term, you can do nothing. You can break fellowship with God by sinning. You can do nothing without your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can do nothing without abiding. For apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. And maybe in your life, here's some application for you. Or perhaps you see it in other people's lives because you are abiding in Christ. You see people who are close to, uh, they're close to the church they're close to liking Christian things. They like the idea of, of God and this relationship with Jesus, but they have these walls and blocks in the way that are causing them to take these next steps spiritually. They have this fear and this anxiety of which the scriptures all talk about and give ways to deal with and handle that. God says, cast your cares upon me and I will sustain you. 1 John 3, 9 through 10, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot be, keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so the idea is you're going to wrestle with the flesh and this broken down old body until you leave this earth. But the idea is, as I abide in Christ, and I realize that all of my strength, all of my abilities, all of my wisdom, all of the truth that resides in me is because of how close I am to Jesus Christ. You see, verse 6, Jesus is deeply challenging Christians to become more intimate with Him. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, they're thrown into the fire, and they're burned. You see, Jesus is telling you, you need to have this intimate relationship with me. And as you have this intimate relationship with me, what will happen is you'll bear, you will bear great fruit, and that fruit will magnify and glorify God and His kingdom. The main point is that non-abiding fruitless branches are useless. So you could read this text and maybe go, he's talking about the useless branches being thrown into hell. Well, from what I gathered from studying, basically, this is, again, this is an allegory, and so we don't think that Jesus was saying, if you're going to be a, uh, a non-productive branch, you're just cast into hell. I think the point is that we should interpret the fire here as a literal or represent, we should not interpret the, the fire here as a literal or representation of hell. But his point is that Christians who do not abide and bear fruit, they're completely useless. And so if you're here and you claim to have saving faith in Jesus Christ and you're not bearing any fruit, Jesus says you're useless. Because the objective isn't to get saved and go sit in a church somewhere. The objective is to 
find saving faith in Jesus Christ, and then you go out and magnify Christ to a lost and hurting world, proclaiming the good news. That's the whole point. Everything we're doing here isn't about the color of the carpet, the air conditioning, the padded seats, the things on the windows, the sound system. Everything here is about equipping us to go out into the world and tell them this good news. Lost people that they can be saved because they're separated from God because of their sinful nature they inherited from birth. The moment you pick a flower, it dies because it's separated from its source of life, although it doesn't appear to be dead yet. But the seeds of death are automatically built into the breaking of relationship. And when we cut the flower off from the tree or vine, fellowship is immediately broken between the flower and the vine. So if you hand somebody a flower, you're basically handing them something that's dead. It may be pink, red, or yellow, but you just handed them death. Just give it a little time, and the death will become very evident in that rose or flower. You see, the change of color... It gets old, as intentioned as you may have been in sharing that flower. Death is actually what you have given a person that you say you love. Lack of relationship of the flower with the vine results in its death. So in verse 7, when Jesus says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is what Jesus is getting at. If my words abide in you, he means, if, if I abide in you speaking all my will, he means if my words are received and remembered and believed and pondered as the living words of a living and present Lord in your life, you will be aligning and asking to do the will of God. And so you hear people in strange applications somehow conclude that they can name and claim things that I don't even think are biblical or God's will. God doesn't care whether you drive a red, black, or blue truck in my personal opinion, or white truck. What God cares about is if you've aligned yourself, you're abiding in Him, you know His will, then you know how to pray, you know how to ask for things. A simple thing to pray for is all of the people you dislike. The Bible calls, the Bible calls those your enemies. And instead of hating on them and gossiping and talking about them, Jesus says, this is what you should do. You should pray for them. You should do good to them. And you should ask me to bless them for you. Again, not how I conclude in my natural flesh. If you are abiding in him, you will not pray selfish prayers. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Be doers, James tells us in 122, of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So you're starting to see a pattern here. The will of God is found in the word and mind of God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Which is what I was doing in my situation with Shiloh, which is what I know many of you who have challenges and difficulties need to obediently do right now is not lean on your own understanding because you see no path through. Perhaps you're in a pruning process, and we just discussed what pruning is. So you have this verse 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that, you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. As a life of communion with God, this is what it should look like. A love-filled, joyous life. People should see the Christ in you magnifying itself outwardly. Thank you.